Good morning. This is John Coates, July 24th, 2000, here in Natick, Massachusetts. This is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. And this morning we are pleased to have with us Richard Smith. Richard, how are you today? Good, thank you, John. And may I call you Dick? Please. I understand your friends do. Please do. Uh, may I begin by asking you how old you are? I'm uh, 78. 78, mm -hmm. and what is your current address? Wellesley. Wellesley, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. uh, marital status? Uh, widow. Uh, do you have children? No, we don't. Didn't. Where were you born, Dick? Born in Worcester, Massachusetts, just up the road a piece. So and, you're uh, a Bay Stater? Oh, yes. And were you raised in Worcester? I went through uh, high school, and until I went into service, I was in uh, Worcester. So you graduated from Worcester High? North High School. Okay, right. about what year was that? Uh, 1940. 1940. Was that a good year to be getting out of high school? There was it pretty lot awful, going. It seemed awfully good, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, how did you get to Natick? Excuse me, to Wellesley. Did you move there from uh, no, Worcester? No, it's been a long, we've been here about 28 years, and uh, before that we've been all over the country for the, for the company, insurance company I worked for. Mm -hmm. So we've just been in Wellesley for 28 years. Can you <clears> tell <throat> us what this area was like uh, when you first moved here? This is a long time ago. Can you think back to what it was like? The uh, Central Street in Wellesley certainly has changed. Uh, there's, most of the older stores are now out of business and have left and new stores have come in. Natick has certainly changed in the last well, oh, five or six years. It's been such a tremendous change here in Natick that it's uh, it's unbelievable. It's really spruced up the center, and it's uh, it's it's fun to drive through. If you don't have to make a left turn. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> what was your family background, Dick? Uh, sort of a mixed background. What did your dad do? My my dad was uh, was uh, in accounting for U.S. Steel in Worcester, and uh, he was from Vermont. Originally, uh, his father was a Methodist minister who, uh, uh, one of these sort of traveling ministers, so he lived in most rural areas of Vermont in his, in his youth. And how about your mother? My mother was born in Worcester, raised in Worcester, and died in Worcester. She, uh, she was, uh, f uh, had been in Worcester all of her life. Now you told us she graduated from Worcester High in 1940. Mm -hmm. Uh, about 18 years old, something like that? 18 to 19. And yeah. what did you do then? Uh, I didn't realize at the time, but it stood me in good stead. I, uh, I uh, went into embalming. I went to work for an undertaker as an apprentice for about uh, nine or ten months. And then uh, I left there and went to, to uh, a bank in Worcester. And I enlisted from the bank into the, in the Navy. That's uh, my records show that you uh, joined the service in 1942. Right. You had um, the, you volunteered. Volunteered. So that you had your choice of what service you would go into. That's the reason that I volunteered. I uh, went in on a Saturday, and my mother said on Monday the greetings came from the draft board, which and would have foreclosed your uh, choices. Would have been. I might have been the Navy, but I wanted the Navy yeah. badly. So why did you pick the Navy? Uh, my father was a Marine in the First World War, and uh, we went to a meeting uh, of the Marine Corps, and uh, at the meeting there was some Navy corpsmen, pharmacist mates, medical corpsmen there, and I got talking with them, and I've always been interested in medical aspect, and so uh, I found that in the Marines they use Navy corpsmen. So, uh, on the way home, my dad says, well, you're going to join the Marines? And I said, no, I'm going to join the Navy if I can and become a pharmacist mate, which I don't think he uh, was too pleased with that. But later on, he was more than pleased uh, from what he went through in the First World War and what I went through. There was quite a difference. You're going to be a pharmacist mate in 1942. You've joined the Navy. Um, did you join it out of Worcester or out of Boston or where? No, I joined it at uh, Worcester. And uh, taking the physical, uh, I had to make an application out. And on that, fortunately, I put down that I'd had nine months of uh, apprentice and bombing experience. Uh, and I noticed some of the men were uh, looking at it and t 
talking about on the side, so uh, I didn't know what the problem was. When they got through the physical, they said, would I be willing to go to uh, Springfield to the head medical officer of this district? Uh, he wanted to ask me a few questions, so I, they sent me up to Springfield, had a few questions with the captain up there in the medical corps, and uh, he said, would you uh, be interested in becoming a pharmacist mate's third class? Well, I said, is that better than an apprentice seaman? And of course, the room broke up because uh, that's a Mr. Apprentice Seaman, Seaman Second, and Seaman First. They became a petty officer and never went to boot camp. So I, uh, as I say, it was a, a fortunate thing as far as I was concerned. So in 42, uh, the Navy's need for your particular skills was so great that you skipped boot camp entirely. That's right. I went, uh, was sworn in on a Saturday noon. I received a bus fare to Boston and a dime to get subway from South Station over to Chelsea Naval Hospital. And at 5 o'clock that afternoon, I was on one of the surgery wards in my civilian clothes. Uh, I had no more than they showed me my bunk in the, in the bunk room. Then they said, no, go over to the hospital. They want you in, in uh, surgery. So uh, I was on duty from 5 o'clock Saturday afternoon. And from then on, uh, I was... Uh, I was busy in the surgery. That was the time when the North Atlantic was having a rough time losing ships with their convoys. And so many of the ships were lost that uh, a great many uh, seriously injured sailors and merchant marine were, uh, were uh, sent back to Chelsea as well as they were taking pharmacist mates out of Chelsea Hospital to go on, these, on the ships. So they were very desperate for, for pharmacist mates. So uh, as I say, uh, we had some pretty tough cases that were coming in from the torpedoing and the problems they had in the North Atlantic run. Let me ask you a question from a layman who knows absolutely nothing about it. But what is the relationship between embalming and surgery? Well, uh, you had nine months of training yeah, as an the, apprentice uh, embalmer. The anatomy, the uh, instruments, the uh, I guess one of the facts that you uh, have seen, seen death and worked with uh, people who, uh, who were dead. And uh, so I uh, evidently answered the questions correctly. And uh, again, I think it was mainly the instruments and the fact that uh, I had some knowledge of, of, uh, of anatomy mm -hmm. uh, from, from the past experience. Did you feel comfortable doing that? that you, uh, did you feel that you knew what you were doing? Yes, for the yeah. type of work I was in at that time, uh, I did. Uh, they were so desperate, and uh, it was it was war duty, as in civilian life it would have been uh, uh, trained nurses, uh, uh, temperatures and uh, changing dressings, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, keeping the patients comfortable, <clears throat> and uh, in and in surgery sometimes with the uh, with the surgical teams. Uh, so I felt I, I didn't uh, feel uncomfortable. I felt uncomfortable the way I was dressed, but. During the week, they uh, would call me down and issue me a little few pieces of clothing, and then I'd go out to South Station, uh, and there was a lot of Navy operations down there that uh, tailors, and they would fit me to the uniforms. And uh, then after a few days, I was in naval naval uniform, and sent my civilian clothes home. But it was uh, it was unusual. Were you stationed at Chelsea? That is, you didn't go home at night. Oh, no. You were I, there? You, I was yeah. stationed right there. And how long were you there at Chelsea? About uh, five weeks. And then uh, we didn't know it at the time, of course, but a group of us were sent to the Naval Training Station in Geneva, New York, Sampson Naval Training Station. And we left on a Saturday. And that was a Saturday night when the Coconut Grove fire occurred. And talking to our buddies later on, they were working most of the night with the people that uh, they could save uh, from that uh, fiasco in the, the nightclub. So we missed that by Can you hours. give me the date of that, the Coconut Grove fire? It was somewhere around November, I think it was in November 20, in the November 20s, I think, 28, something like of that. Of what year? Of 44. Of, oh, only we're up to 44? Uh, I'm sorry, 40, 42. Okay, 42. I, I thought I missed something yeah, there. No. Okay, thanks. Uh, back to Chelsea. What did you like about the work there? Uh, the professionalism of the, of the corpsman, never having worked with anybody in the service before, as well as the camaraderie with the uh, officers who were, number one, they were primarily 
doctors, and secondarily, they were doing their part by uh, having joined the Navy. And uh, they, to my mind, uh, the officers and enlisted men were uh, much closer than a good many types of work in the, in mm -hmm. the Navy would have been. And uh, it was very informative. And in fact, some of them uh, would, uh, at my request, would call me during the night and they were going to have a major, they were going to have a major uh, uh, emergency operation and they'd call me up to the, if I wanted to come up to the operating room to, to watch the operation. And then we'd go down and have some coffee and sandwiches and discuss what they had done and the, out, mm -hmm. the outcome and so on. So it, uh, to me it was a real learning experience. When you enlisted back in Worcester, <coughs> did any of your friends join the service at the same time? Uh, they had been off and on, but some of them waited for the draft and some had gone in earlier. But at the actual time I went in, I don't know of anybody in particular that went in around the same time. Okay, so did. you were at Chelsea pretty much all by yourself. I was a one-man draft. Because you had nobody from boot camp that came no. along with you no, either. Right. All right, then, then you went over to Geneva, New York. Yeah. And what were you doing there? There we, uh, it was a naval training station where they sent recruits for 13 weeks of basic training. And uh, in those 13 weeks, uh, they get all of the rigors of basic training. And uh, they had different units. And each unit had uh, 15 or 20 barracks with 110 men apiece, a drill field and a mess hall, and uh, a dispensary. And I was in the dispensary with other pharmacist mates and doctors. And we took care of the inoculations, the uh, minor surgery. Uh, we had a little maybe eight or 10 bed ward that we could keep fellows there if uh, they weren't seriously ill. And then uh, they, uh, they would be sent to the base hospital if necessary. So we uh, took care of the sore feet and the, the uh, uh, cuts and bruises and aches and pains of the rigors of basic training. But they never put you out on the field to learn that you had two left feet, is that no, correct? No, I, I had that when I came in, I still have it. <laughs> you no, never they, got any of that stuff? No, I, and the more I, I was there about 15 months at uh, Sampson, and the more I saw what went on, I was more and more thankful that I had been able to go in as a pharmacist mate third uh, without having to go through boot camp. You were there 15 months? About 15 months. This brings us up to uh, 43, somewhere in there? Yes, yeah. Okay. And uh, did you ever get home during that time? Oh, yes. I'd get home uh, quite often on a weekend pass. We'd leave at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, hitch a ride to Syracuse, get a train for Boston, Worcester, and uh, get there about 8 o'clock Saturday night and leave 8 o'clock Sunday night and uh, get back to Syracuse to take a bus to the base and get back just in time to clean up and go on duty at 7 o'clock in the morning. Hmm. But uh, I couldn't do it now, but at that time... No, but at least you got home. I got home. Yeah. When you're at a place 15 months, you begin to make friends because other guys <clears throat> are there a long time. Uh, did you make lasting friendships? Uh, a few uh, in the Navy, or at least uh, it was my observation that there's less uh, group to go together. There's a lot of one-man drafts and small group drafts. There is one fellow that uh, I met at Sampson who lived in Boston, so we came home together on weekends when we got him off, and I was with him uh, through the invasion, and then he uh, went to a different uh, base than I did after the uh, invasion was over. So to me, there wasn't the same uh, ability of becoming a, a unit that there is in, uh, in the Army and, and in the Marines. You folks had access to radios, newspapers, Stars and Stripes, or whatever the mm -hmm. Navy equivalent was for that. Uh, you certainly knew what was going on in the, in the, the war in, in the uh, European theater, right. the Pacific theater. Did you look ahead to think of, uh, you know, you, you knew you weren't going to stay in, uh, up in New York State for the rest of your life. Did you have any druthers as to what theater of operation you'd like to go to? No, I, I guess we just worked from day to day and knew it would be somewhere. And uh, we didn't know when and we had no control over it. So. Yeah. At that age, I guess you just sort of uh, take things as they, as they come. The opposite side of that is, is there any place that you sure didn't want to go to? Well, I didn't want to go to the Fleet Marines. Uh, and later on, some of my buddies did from the Pacific, and some of them were killed and some were uh, 
had the psychological problems and, and some were badly, badly wounded. And again, the medical corps of the Marines is the naval corpsman, so that was always a possibility of mm -hmm. any naval corpsman being sent to the, to the Marine Corps. Is there a distinction between being a pharmacist um, and a medic? No, it's, it, it's the same. You're the guy they call for when they yell right. medic, medic. Hey, doc. We yeah. call doc, yeah. Even on the street, uh, it amazed me when I still in uh, Chelsea and didn't know uh, left from the right, as you say, and anything about the Navy, and I had my uniform at the time with the, the crow, the uh, third class pharmacist mate uh, patch on my shoulder, and Marines would walk down the street and, and always, always speak, because later on I found that they relied so on the, on uh, the medical corps when mm -hmm. in battle and uh, so as I say there I was, was a great deal of respect uh, absolutely. by the marines for the uh, corpsman absolutely did the military <clears throat> or did the navy um, talk to you about if you ever did go to Europe or to the Pacific the differences in culture did they prepare you for being in a foreign place no uh, I don't recall anything uh, like that in fact the uh, joke was that uh, if you were issued Arctic gear, you were going to the Pacific, and if you were issued li lightweight gear, you were probably going to the Atlantic. Yep, that's, that's so, the way. <laughs> so uh, that's the only reference we had to it. We figured we would go to the opposite place. Did you go to any other bases or any other schools to uh, further your training? Uh, after we left Sampson, we went to Lido Beach, Long Island, which I understand was a uh, country club. It wasn't when we got there, but uh, we had two or three weeks training there, but mainly uh, with the carbines, the rifles, and uh, uh, first aid and survival, uh, not knowing that we were going aboard a LST shortly thereafter. I think about three weeks there, and then we went to uh, Bayonne, New Jersey, uh, and picked up our uh, LST. And there again, our, there was a big group went down from Sampson, and only 20 went from each to each of the ships, so that that's where you lose your your friends uh, as far as the contact goes. Mm -hmm. For the record, how big is an LST? Uh, as I recall, it was about 300 feet. And how many men would it take? Uh, probably take 150 or so. It's it's a small small ship. The bow doors open and the ramp lets down, and they go right on the beach and let the tanks and trucks go out, as well as the uh, infant infantry men, and then. They back off when the tide is right and uh, uh, close up the doors and it saves having to build docks and going in where there's a, already a, a harbor. You spoke a moment ago <clears throat> of, of learning to use a carbine. Um, did medics arm themselves? Well, that was a strange thing. We were told that uh, all the way along that uh, medics couldn't carry sidearms or, mm -hmm. or a carbine uh, and they issued us one. And, uh, we had uh, several hours of, of training on the range with it in, in New York before we got on the LST. We kept them on the LST, and uh, then in about two or three weeks, they, after you get to England, they uh, took them away. Uh, because evidently, my supposition was that if you did land and get into trouble, at least you'd have some protection. But I've never heard of a pharmacist mate other than the Marines that uh, uh, ever went ashore armed. In fact, on the ship, we were supposed to wear armbands with the Red Cross so the ship company could call on us if they were injured, and we refused to wear them, and the captain had no objections to that because that story was that that was uh, the way that the uh, enemy would zero in on a person or a ship, the snipers, because you'd, they'd see the Red Cross, and they knew a Red Cross meant help to the wounded, and the more that they got help to, the less they had, the enemy had killed. So. Um, we never, except firing on the range, we never used the, the carbines. <clears throat> you were you're sailing out of Bayonne, New Jersey, is that correct? You're right. Mm -hmm. On a ship, did you know you were where you were going? Yes, we knew it was uh, it was going to be England. We didn't know anything about the uh, invasion, of course. And what was, what about what date was that? That was in uh, probably the end of January of early February of uh, 44. And luck would have it, we uh, came up through the Cape Cod Canal into, into Boston and had four days 
of which I was able to get home for one or two of them. Good. And uh, yeah. we didn't know where we were going, but it was Boston. Well, they loaded up with supplies and, and uh, uh, fuel and what have you. And then we left Boston, went to Halifax and uh, Nova Scotia. And there we picked up a, we waited two or three days and picked up a large convoy to go, uh, to, go to England. The uh, convoy was made up of uh, tramp steamers and tankers, some still coal burning uh, ships at that point because they were losing so many of the mm -hmm. ships. And uh, we had to go in the convoy as slow as the slowest ship, which unfortunately was about nine knots or 10 or 11 miles an hour. So we were about uh, 18 or 20 days from Halifax over to England. Did you gather in the uh, Bedford Basin up there at Halifax? I don't remember the you name know, of the basin. That's, we, I we, think, where the convoys We were in the gathered. harbor, and uh, a lot of ships came in and were there when we got there, and we all left together with a large escort of uh, corvettes and British and Canadian and American uh, destroyers and corvettes, and this was a very large, uh, large convoy. You're about 20 years <coughs> old, and uh, right. I th if I follow you, and <coughs> You're on a ship and you're up in Halifax and this great fleet is gathering around. Tell us what that was like. What well, did it look like? At that, at that age, uh, at least personally, it was uh, a lock or a game. I don't think I ever thought about uh, what was ahead or what, uh, what might happen, but it was just unbelievable, the number of ships and the way they could get them together and our escorts on the side, the, as I say, the escort ships, the destroyers and Corvettes and uh, and all and, and we we at least I never and we never talked about the fatalism or the possibility of anything ever happening to us uh, between Halifax and England. Uh, the, one of our convoy ships right off our, bar, our starboard side uh, sunk a submarine and they it shot up like a cigar up through the the, the bow and then went down and uh, they saved one officer and ten men uh, a German sub. Uh, but again, that was, at the time, at least to me, it was uh, like a dream. It wasn't, wasn't real. So I had no feeling of, uh, I guess, fear, you want to call it that. In your particular position as a pharmacist, did you look at where you're going in terms of they're not going to shoot at me or they're going to shoot at other guys, but I'm going to have to go out and help them? What no. was your point of view? No, point of view was that uh, in, on a ship, we were all, if they sunk the ship, it, it uh, didn't matter whether you were a pharmacist mate, a, a boatswain mate, or a, or a uh, signalman, you, you uh, all were in the, pardon the expression, in the same boat. And uh, I meant when the boat got there. Well, we didn't, uh, we didn't go off, uh, as I'll explain later what our right. function was uh, during the invasion. And how long were you at sea? Uh, well, as I say, we were it was about 17, 18 days over to uh, England from uh, from Halifax, which is now about three and a half, four days. Uh, That's pretty slow. Very yeah. slow, but again, it was yeah. based on the slowest ship in the convoy. Did you see aircraft overhead? There weren't too many planes till we got to the near the coast of England. We ran into some e-boats and had to change our course. Tell us what an e-boat is. An e-boat is the same as our PT boat. It's a uh, very small, sleek, very fast uh, boat with probably eight or nine in the crew with torpedoes. And they are the ones that uh, can sneak in and out quickly and do an awful lot of damage. And uh, that was their job. Their function was to, when they get close into the sh it's closer to shore, the subs would not come in, but the e-boats would take over trying to break up the convoys and destroy and, and the ship. And you saw some of those boats from yours? Oh, yes. 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 Where did you land in England? Landed in, uh, in Plymouth, believe it or not. On the South Shore. The South Shore, yeah. right. So you saw Land's End and you went all by that and got right. up to Plymouth. We stopped at Milford Haven coming down uh, yeah. Milford Haven, Wales, but our first really stepping on land was in Plymouth, uh, Plymouth England. <laughs> so they let you off the ship finally? Oh yes, finally. Yeah. And where did you go? Uh, right above that. The uh, harbor was a, uh, I guess it would have, had been a mansion and they'd made it a Red Cross uh, uh, center. And we got up there and got some uh, American coke and some of the things that we hadn't had uh, aboard ship. 
Bring me up to date again, Dick. When did you get to England? Got to England uh, in uh, early uh, early March. This is March of forty four. Forty four. Okay. What did you do? Well, we did a lot of uh, of uh, maneuvers with uh, other LSTs, getting uh, getting ready for. Then we knew that was the invasion was coming. Didn't know where or when, uh, and. Uh, we uh, did a lot of maneuvers up and in, in and out of the coast. We went to several different. Uh, it sounded like we were home in Massachusetts, Falmouth, Portland, mm -hmm. Plymouth, uh, and a great many of the, all the sea coast uh, ports. And we would go in and out of those, uh, as well as on these maneuvers. As well as we did have some instruction from senior uh, medical officers uh, on uh, the possibility of what we would see and get for casualties. Uh, when the invasion took place. It was our function to uh, let off the troops and, and the equipment and then bring the wounded aboard and uh, we uh, worked on them uh, on the uh, mess tables. I have, this I is still the same LST you LST. went overseas on? No, I'm sorry. We changed. Uh, okay. Before the invasion, some of us went to uh, another LST, but it was the same, uh, same setup. The same idea. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little more about what they told you to prepare for? Well, they prepared us for uh, uh, all types of, uh, of uh, injuries, naturally. The shrapnel, the, uh, the uh, flamethrowers, the dum-dum bullets that go in the size of your little finger and come out the back, or the other, the other side, uh, you know, the size of an orange or grapefruit, which just tears the, the uh, inside out, and uh, burns eye burns particularly, and, uh, and broken bones, and we saw all of those. Uh, they were very, they were really correct when they said that that would be what we would, uh, okay. would get. Okay. Well, did they talk to you anything about what we today would refer to as chemical warfare? Yes, yes. We, uh, we all had gas masks and we had, uh, we had uh, quite a few drills and how to use them and uh, that we might get some gas casualties and that would be a different, uh, I've forgotten the details now, but that would be a different uh, situation. In fact, on the LST, we <coughs> carried uh, several big cylinders uh, and unbeknownst to us, it was, it was gas in case of retaliation, but they never used it, so we never used it. And I don't, uh, I don't think that uh, they ever intended to, but they just had it on board in case uh, they had to. As I remember, uh, Plymouth was a very popular place to be, get bombed, uh, the, the Germans, <laughs> yes. in the sense of aerial warfare, Right. Uh, that the Germans bombed it fr uh, frequently. Can you tell us about that? Yes, I've got uh, some notes. Well, one thing, uh, Saturday night, we would never uh, undress. We'd just take our shoes off and lay in our bunk, because we could almost set our watches by 11.30 to quarter of 12 midnight, that uh, there'd be a nuisance raid. Usually it was nuisance. They'd come over and swoop down low, and and uh, we'd find shrapnel on the on the fan tail on the stern of the ship, and sometimes water would have splashed up from some bombs they dropped. But they never seemed to have had much luck with uh, hitting anything. And we don't I don't recall any German plane ever being shot down. But it was more I think of a nuisance or maybe reconnaissance to see what we were building up in, in what ports. Mm -hmm. But as I say, for it was a standing joke. We'd we'd uh, go to bed at maybe 10 o'clock and, and uh, say, well, we'll see you in about an hour and a half. And sure enough, there'd be general quarters uh, in uh, between 11.30 and 12 o'clock. And it was usually Saturday night. And uh, they, they did uh, make a nuisance of themselves. But the one, the one night, uh, they, uh, it was less firing and much more quiet. And they were swooping lower. But they weren't firing at the ship. So we couldn't understand the next morning, being Sunday, uh, a, one of these ships was sending a small craft with some uh, sailors to church in, at, in shore, and it blew up. And come to find out that they had dropped some mines in the harbor, and when they hit the water, they, would, they were, had heavy weights and they had dropped to the bottom. And when a ship uh, propeller turned and the motor went on, engine went on, it, uh, it caused the mine to hit the surface. Uh, 
the, uh, so all day long, the ships, nobody could turn the power on, uh, and uh, they had uh, uh, minesweepers going through the harbor and sailors standing on deck with rifles, and as a mine would come up, they would, they would uh, explode it. These minesweepers are wood, so they wouldn't uh, have the same problem as a metal, a metal hull to attract the, uh, the, the mine. But so they were bombing every night, and particularly on weekends, it seemed. <clears throat> you talked about uh, you and your friends not taking off your anything, shoes and mm. that at night. So you're, you're making some pretty good friends in the service by that time. Uh, did you guys have any relationship with the British or other nationalities that were stationed there? Yeah, later on, uh, uh, three trips to Normandy, uh, two of them were with the British troops and their equipment. Uh, and uh, it was quite a different, quite a different ball game. Not the fellows themselves, but their, uh, the way the officers and the enlisted men were two distinct and separate uh, uh, classes. Uh, and uh, the, uh, very often uh, they'd be standing on deck with us, the enlisted men would be talking, and an officer would come by and they'd snap to attention and salute. Well, our officers wouldn't, wouldn't allow that in, in times of stress like that. They'd just be, we'd all be one big group that uh, was working together. But the British had quite a different uh, attitude about their officers versus their enlisted person. Great distinction in the Great. ranks. Yeah. yeah. What was your rank at that time? I was a second class finalist mate at that time. So I, now you're moving right gained along. Another, gained another rank, yeah. And what other units were around you? How many other ships were collected there at Plymouth? Oh, there, was, there were, uh, I, I can't, I don't remember, but there were a great number, uh, and uh, mainly uh, LSTs because uh, the invasion of Normandy was going to be hitting the beach with the LSTs letting the bow doors down, and they hadn't doing no wharves and yeah, piers to tie up to to let the equipment the off. So the right. there were, uh, I think the uh, there were there were 30 or 40 probably uh, at a time. Then there were other ships, supply ships, that were supplying us in the harbor. U.S. Uh, naval ships, and then of course all the uh, destroyers and uh, uh, other ships that were in the that ran the convoys to keep us uh, safe from the e-boats and the uh, mm -hmm. subs. Now, you when you landed in England, <coughs> you were about 90 days away from D-Day, right? Um, as you got closer to that date, did you feel a sense of urgency in your training, or did it? Tra uh, did the tenor of it change so that you knew the clock was running out? Well, we knew the clock was running out several several different ways because uh, uh, nearer the time, within a couple of weeks, no one was allowed off the ship. Even the uh, young enlisted man that went in to pick up the mail had to have an officer accompany him because once we'd been told where it was going to be, at least the invasion of Normandy, no one was allowed off the ship. So now, wait a minute, say that again. You You were told where it was going to well, be? Well, I mean, it was going to be an invasion of Normandy, and uh, the Normandy beach was, you know... You knew that ahead yes. of time? Yeah. But, but nobody else, I mean, uh, we had to... Mum was, mum was the word, we had to stay aboard ship, and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, everybody that had to go ashore was accompanied by uh, an officer, and, uh, and there was sworn to secrets. Were you in a position to see that the... Uh, the fleet around you was growing, or that the guys were uh, coming from other bases on land and filling up ships. Could you see literally the the buckets getting filled down Our there? Our own ship. The same. We uh, yeah. we picked up uh, uh, groups uh, who were, we would run for some uh, maneuvers, and then uh, also before D-Day, we uh, picked up the group we were taking over to Normandy, and that was a. Uh, it's always stuck in my mind as a uh, real difficult uh, time for some of the fellows. Uh, naturally, they were army personnel, and uh, they, uh, the ship was crowded with uh, trucks with high explosive shells and tanks and reconnaissance uh, trucks, and uh, the troops had to stay on deck and, and uh, sort of shift for themselves. So we'd get talking with them, and after a while, um, one of the officers pulled some of us aside and said, "Don't." argue with these fellows. He said, just uh, pass the time of day, but don't get into too deep a discussion. 
they have just come from Italy and Africa, and they were told they were on the way back to the States, but they cut them off here and uh, are sending them back to, uh, to Normandy. And there's some of Patton's troops, and they weren't the, the happiest, naturally the happiest lot of, of young fellows. Africa was in November of 42. Where were these guys in the Well, in they, the must have been, they must have been uh, uh, Italy and Africa. They were, or they were the troops that had been there. And yeah. I don't know where they'd been in between. Yeah. But they were, they were hardened, hardened veterans. Dick, before we uh, started this tape, you told me of an incident that took place in training uh, where evidently it had been, I think your phrase was, hushed up. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that now? Uh, we went out on maneuvers one night, uh, and uh, we were the lead uh, LST. And I think there were about 20 LSTs in the group. Uh, we hadn't gotten very far out when uh, we stopped, and our orders were to uh, fall back and let other ships go ahead of us, which we did. And uh, about two hours later, all hell broke loose. The uh, uh, e-boats had come down. These are the Germans. The German e-boats yeah. had come down, and uh, they had they sank the two lead LSTs, one that would have been us had we not changed our position, and uh, damaged one very severely. And there were a huge number of uh, soldiers. All the ships were ready. It was the maneuver they were going to land and on this British beach as a practice landing, and uh, a lot of them were lost, as well as. Uh, almost 200 uh, sailors. Uh, so it was a real, it was a real fiasco. Uh, come to find out, uh, some of the, some of the uh, escorts weren't able to make the, the trip with us, and uh, the e-boats had pretty slim, pretty easy pickings. Uh, I had written up about it, uh, keep an, I kept a note of it, and then in 1987 I was in a doctor's office, and uh, he had a fairly recent magazine, a People magazine, and I couldn't believe what I saw. It was about a four-page spread on this uh, uh, fiasco that was covered up all these years, and uh, they had, uh, uh, and the times and dates were exactly what I had in my notes. Can we just pause here a second? Can we get a close-up of uh, Dick's little book here? Not literally pause, but can you uh, bring the camera up, Bob? Can you show us uh, yeah. in a second here uh, a close-up of the, the little book? Yeah. And you told is, me yeah. before it had gotten wet. Did yeah, it, it's, uh, it's been... Did uh, it I, get wet that night? No, oh, all I, well, I carried it the whole time I was in yeah. there. And this is the book in which you recorded yeah. uh, the great loss of life that night. Yeah, here... Uh, Let's see, oh, uh, April 28, 2.30, that's 2.30 in the morning, General Quarters, E-boats attacked LST convoy half an hour ahead of us, flares and shore batteries, LSTs beside us fired their 20s and 40s, two LSTs sunk, one damaged, and uh, we secured at four, 4 in the morning. And that's all I ever knew about it. Nothing was said when we got back to base and uh, until in 1987. When the date rang a bell with that article, it uh, was in the uh, People magazine, and uh, this article explains that it was intentional or otherwise. It was so overpowered by the invasion a little later that it, that it was just never, and those fellows were never recognized uh, until some English person had uh, spent years and years to. Uh, Get a memorial built, and it was just done, and just before that. Uh, Do you know how many men were lost that night? Yeah, yeah. It, uh, 197 sailors was it, uh, Barbara? And 400 and I'll, I'll, I'll find it. Am I being too explicit in things? Or? Not at all. Okay. Uh, That's can, okay. We'll it's, uh, we'll get back to that. 400 and. 50, I think, soldiers, and, or 750 soldiers, and, uh, and uh, 197 sailors were lost. Were you in, uh, called upon to uh, uh, minister unto these people that night, or no, you went back no, to base? No, we went back to, we the, back to all port. Went back to base. 
This is April of 1944. Right. Come right. May, uh, what did you do in May? More training. More, more training. Okay. We had another. Uh, we had another uh, uh, maneuver with the army, and uh, and then uh, just got loaded up with supplies. They had a what they call the Star Bay maneuvers in uh, uh, May 4th to the May 6th. Uh, and it was just getting them prepared and us prepared how to how to beach and how to handle the uh, the uh, logistics of getting the the troops off. Okay, let's jump up to about the third or fourth of May in 1944. Uh, are you still in Plymouth? Well, we've been we've been in Plymouth, Portland. Uh, as I say, I even got the, the dates, but we've got we were in uh, came into Plymouth. We were in. Uh, uh, Falmouth, Portland, back to Portland, Portland again, and up to Thames to London to pick up some British troops on our second trip over, uh, and then Portsmouth, uh, and Portsmouth, Southampton, all those southern, southern ports. We we hit them all at different times. Tell me now about uh, sailing over to the invasion of uh, the coast of Normandy. Uh, we left. We left about. Uh, Mid-evening uh, on the 5th of June. In fact, we tried the night before, but it was too rough. It was a very bad storm. Did you, were you part of the group that started out and were called back? Yes. Yeah, we how far, how close did you get to the coast of France? Just outside the harbor and yeah. uh, maybe an hour or so out, maybe 10 or 15 miles at, at the most. And the seas were just too rough. Uh, so they called us back and uh, we did it the next night. And that okay. night. Okay, you're on an LST. You're what, 20 years old? By that time, 21, yeah, I guess. 21 20, years 20, old. 22. And you're heading into the greatest battle in, in the history of the world, in one of the greatest collection of ships in the history of the world. Tell us what it was like. Well, I was one of the fortunate ones, I think, of my Coleman group, because uh, I was assigned, uh, my general quarters battle station was in the wheelhouse. Uh, and my duties were first aid for the wheelhouse, and on top of the wheelhouse was a con tower, conning tower, where the the officers were stationed out in the open uh, to to steer and to handle the ship from there. Uh, and then behind us was a radio shack, so that I was privy to all of the radio communication between the officers on the bridge and the wheelhouse and the radio shack that was dealing with other ships and in convoys, so uh, I, uh, it was, I have often thought it was like a, when the planes were coming over and they were firing at us and we were firing back with our, our deck guns, uh, it was almost like uh, uh, a football game. I mean, there's another one, go get him, and, and uh, we got him, uh, and you know, the sky was full of, uh, every third shell was a tracer, so you see these red shells, uh, projectiles everywhere, and between those red projectiles there were two, two live ones. And, uh, but I, I guess maybe it was just my personality, but I just, uh, I never thought about tomorrow. I just, it was the moment at hand. I wasn't uh, overly concerned uh, with, I guess because I had so much faith in the ship and the, the crew and, uh, and... Were Were you carrying troops that were to be deposited on the beach? Can you tell us what beach was your objective? Yeah, we, uh, we were uh, at uh, the left-hand side of Omaha, uh, between the towns of Bayou, my French, I don't know French, Bayou and Caen, C-O-A-N, uh, uh, and there were two, uh, two of the towns up on the, up on the bluffs. And were you headed toward Utah Beach? It was near Utah, yeah. between Utah and Omaha, yeah. But we couldn't go in the first trip because uh, they had those uh, railroad ties sunk as, uh, as obstacles and they were mined. And some of the small ships that went in, the uh, Higgins boats that they made so much publicity about recently, how, what a godsend they were, uh, and they were, they would go in with about 25 or 30 of the troops. And if they get hit broadside, one of those, um, they blow up the, the ship, the boat, because of the uh, uh, they had booby trapped those uh, mm -hmm. ties. Uh, when they opened the bow doors on the beach, uh, there were gunners and sh guns just the 
pillboxes and just waiting for the uh, bow doors to open and the first any number of fellows would be uh, would be killed instantly. What time of day this was this? We went in. Uh, we went in uh, late afternoon of the sixth, as we stayed out, but the, our uh, troops our troops went in, and uh, we were we were within a three mile point of the beach because we couldn't get in the LSTs because of these, as I say, these mined obstacles. And how, how did the troops get off your boat and get to the beach? They uh, ship. They they had these big uh, rope ladders on the cargo nets on the side, and they'd climb down those into into L L L LCVPs, the landing craft personnel, yeah. uh, the Higgins boats, and then they'd go in they'd go in from there, and those Higgins boats had just two uh, two personnel on them, uh, and uh, no armament. At the most, might be a, a very small machine gun, mounted machine gun, but uh, they were just uh, sitting ducks. They had no uh, no defense, and as I say, they uh, the equipment they had to back up some rhinos, which were uh, flat bottom uh, steel plated equipment. It was put together and had two had small motors on the back, and it was like a uh, a, a floating pier, and they would lower they would drive the trucks and tanks onto this rhino. Uh, and then they would start their two engines, and they would take them into shore by, by their power. But it was so rough that it was very difficult to get the equipment onto these rhinos and to get them uh, uh, into shore. They had some ducks, the same equipment that they use in this Boston uh, mm -hmm. uh, program here of, uh, for visitors. And uh, the first, uh, first one that went off swamped, and they had to pull the two, two men out of it. Uh, it was just unbelievably rough, even though we were within three miles and inside of the battleships and the cruisers and the uh, heavy guns that were firing over our heads onto the, onto the beach, but it was just a, a real bad storm. Very often one of the things that's left out when people describe that morning um, <clears throat> is the noise. Oh. What did it sound like to be there off Utah Beach on the 6th of June? Just it's 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 un, it's unbelievable, indescribable. The uh, the uh, uh, ships firing, and then the uh, big ships, the battleships and cruisers, as they say, out behind us, uh, and then the planes strafing, and our planes uh, trying to keep them, the German planes, out of the, out of the picture, and uh, and on we you'd hear some from the beach, but uh, not nearly as much as we were getting from from our own uh, firing around uh, our own ships. And the planes uh, in the air that were bombing and uh, and uh, firing you know, their machine guns. The uh, eerie, once eerie thing that still sticks in my mind is when a battleship would uh, would fire one of their huge guns. Uh, if you happen to be looking at the battleship, you'd see a puff of smoke, and then just a minute, a second or so later, you'd feel a you'd hear a swish and feel your pant legs flapping, and then. A few seconds later, you'd see an explosion on the beach. It was that projectile going over that, uh, it, uh, as I say, it still uh, sticks in my mind as uh, one of the unusual, I guess it's physics, phenomenons of... Uh, of a shockwave. Shockwaves, yeah. Were you close enough to see the men on the beach? Uh, not that. The second and third trip we were, but that trip we, we weren't. But they, they brought the wounded out to us. and. Uh, when they brought him out, uh, I don't know how this happened. I, I linked up with a um, army major who was a surgeon, and we and there were other pharmacist mates and some other uh, medical officers also that worked together. And the two of us, it was like triage. The two of us would uh, they bring the wounded to us. We used mess tables. They had no operating rooms or medical facilities in Ashmole ship, so they. They would bring the uh, wounded to us. We would uh, uh, have to undress them and clean them up. A lot of them were so sandy and had been laying in the water and and uh, mud and and uh, and some had been treated by uh, medics on the on the beach. But we had to naturally change all the dressings and administer plasma and give them uh, penicillin and uh, do the best we could to uh, patch them up until we could get them back to England. Where they could get real treatment in a in a uh, 
base hospital. I remember one uh, young officer that uh, uh, had a very small bullet hole in his chest, yet he was breathing so heavily and uh, frothing that, that uh, we knew it was, it was more than meets the eye. So I happened to reach behind him, taking off his shirt, and there was one of those dum-dum bullets that had gone in very small on the front of his chest and had blown out a piece of his back. So the, uh, of course, the lung was, uh, they were losing, he was losing pressure, so we had to bandage it up tightly uh, in the back to st stabilize the, the pressure in his, in his uh, thorax and, and allow him to, uh, uh, to breathe. And he, uh, when we took him off the ship a couple of days later in England, he, uh, he, was, he was breathing much better and uh, hopefully, there again, you don't know what happens to these people, but hopefully he, uh, he made it all right. Were all these uh, men Americans? Yes, yeah, because this was our this was the American beach, and so they'd bring them they'd bring them out to the uh, LSTs. So after we got the uh, got them cleaned up and best first aid we could, we'd get back to duty. I was in the wheelhouse, and then they'd call us down, and we'd have two to four hour watches on these people while we're going back to England. They'd be in the the uh, ship's company bunks. There weren't any extra cots or beds for them, so they would be in our bunks uh, for a day or two, and then we would still administer the, the plasma and the uh, penicillin and all of the, uh, the drugs and keep them as comfortable as possible. You were in effect a hospital ship, weren't you? No, it uh, primarily was to get troops to, uh, to the beach and then bring back the wounded. After the third trip, they had established an air base, uh, and then they flew them back and they didn't need us anymore. So uh, in early July, uh, I was on the way back to the States. But on that particular day, when your ship filled up with all these wounded men, what did you do with well, them? Well, they didn't fill us up. They, they couldn't. We didn't have the equipment or the space or supplies. We had, I don't know, eight to ten men, I think, and each of the LSTs would have I the see. same crew of, our, of the pharmacist mates who were assigned to taking care of the wounded. So they were smaller groups, but uh, with the number of men we had and the space we had, eight to ten was uh, a good number to, to handle and, and try to make comfortable and keep them uh, alive. Now, did I understand you th that you did take them back to England? Yes. After we uh, each trip back to England, uh, we would uh, anchor in the harbor and a ship would come around and we would take the wounded off onto this larger ship and they'd be taken to the... Uh, uh, to land, and then, as I say, separated again there from some of the more urgent to those that could wait a little while, and some of those that were really seriously ill were sent to uh, the uh, base hospitals uh, around there. I went in one time with uh, five other pharmacist mates with our group, and uh, they were, uh, uh, I was weren't nearly as badly wounded as, fortunately, as some of the other men that had come off of other LSTs that were going ashore, too. Uh, there was uh, a lot of eye injuries and broken bones and uh, 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 flame flamethrowers or something that caused burns, very severe burns, and uh, some of them didn't, uh, sure didn't make it, but uh, as I say, we never know whether our group did or not. I guess I would ask, did you feel your training uh, prepared you for what the experience you got into? Yeah, I, I think so. I was, you I was, know very, was very comfortable, yeah. and I was very yeah. comfortable with this uh, uh, surgeon who was, an, as I said, an Army major. Uh, the two of us worked, I don't even know his name, I don't think I ever saw him again after that uh, initial uh, time, but uh, he and I worked very well together, and uh, it, uh, we just, I don't remember even talking much with him, it was just we each did our thing, and uh, it worked out very well. So I felt that uh, we'd been trained uh, you know, very well for it. It's very rare that people get to talk to a man who was there that morning or in the ensuing next couple of days. Can you give us an overall impression <clears throat> of being there in the channel and looking at the coast of France and seeing literally thousands and thousands of men engaged in the, the greatest land battle in Europe? Uh, can you tell us your impressions of what, hmm. what you saw and what you heard? Well, this started uh, uh, 
10 or 20 miles out from, uh, and talking about that, it isn't too far across the channel, but we had a zigzag course that they had swept the mines, the minesweepers, so that we had to stay within this zigzag course, so it took us a number of hours to get to England. And many miles out, we saw bodies floating by. Uh, and uh, the closer we got, the more bodies you'd see. Then we get within the three mile range and, and dropped anchor, as I say, because we couldn't get in because of these obstacles. Uh, luckily, I was able to hear f from the uh, radio shack that uh, there was a question of whether they were going to pull out if they were losing, if they were having too many losses to sustain their beachhead. But uh, it was just the, the uh, numbers with us and behind us that just uh, kept pouring men and equipment into the uh, the front, and uh, they did establish a beachhead. And uh, between the coordination of the large ships shelling and the planes overhead, we, I never saw so many airplanes in my life, uh, almost uh, like an umbrella, all the way from England over. Some were going over and load, uh, dumping their loads of bombs and, and strafing the, uh, the enemy and coming back to refuel and get more, and it's just a constant back and forth. So uh, it was. Uh, Surrealistic. It just it, it didn't seem that it was happening. Did you ever have an occasion or an opportunity to talk to guys who were just, say, a mile down the coast, further away? They were at uh, Omaha Beach mm -hmm. instead of where you were. Mm -hmm. And I'm not demeaning your experience whatsoever, but they they really got it down there. They, uh, they, they got it. Uh, did you ever talk to anybody about no, the differences uh, in where you were? I don't, I don't think I, uh, I have uh, known anybody that was at Omaha, but what you read and what uh, you could observe that, uh, I mean, they were getting, uh, they had the cliff there, as I, as I believe. And that was between the two beaches. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, scaling that cliff was... Uh, uh, Point to Hawk, is it, yeah. Yeah, because we didn't know the names of anything. Uh, no. The uh, reason I knew more than some was, I'd say, because I was in the communication center, fortunately, in, in my battle station, so that I heard some of the radio contact and the captain's discussion with the uh, other ships and uh, headquarters and so on. Did you know historically you were looking over at a place called Utah Beach? No. No. At that's, the time, that's interesting. Yeah. No, no all, we, all I knew was it was it was going into Normandy, to, to, to the, the beach, and uh, that church steeple was... Uh, was uh, in Caen, and this building was in uh, uh, Bayou, and so that's the only way I could pinpoint where we were. Even the crew, uh, again, they were given compass directions, and they didn't, uh, that wouldn't give them the uh, information as to uh, which beach it, uh, they were going into. So everybody was just doing what they were told to do and uh, hitting where they were told to hit, and uh, didn't realize it was Omaha or, or uh, or uh, Utah. In fact, uh, the other two trips we made were to uh, the British sector, Juneau Beach, and I, we had no idea that was Juneau till we got back. And there was sword in Juneau, right? Yeah. And and gold, I think, was also mm -hmm. British, I think, or Canadian. Yes. And uh, and until we got back, we didn't. Uh, I didn't know uh, difference between gold and Omaha and Utah, and I just knew the steeple and the other distinguishing mark from the other town, and and uh, that there was a big cliff on uh, Omaha, and uh, yeah, it just, uh, as I say, it, uh, we just didn't think about where we were, it just, uh, we were there. Have you ever been back? No. No, I'm, uh, I haven't, I don't. Uh, Have you spent much time in the, the rest of your life uh, <clears throat> looking to see what happened to you that, did, that morning? Did you get into history books and realize that is Utah Beach, that was yeah, the invasion? Yeah, somewhat. Uh, Reader's Digest put out a huge size book uh, about 15, 20 years ago that we purchased, and it uh, it uh, gave the whole story. And then uh, I was interested in the 50th and 40th anniversary of D-Day when they, you know, mm -hmm. uh, had a lot of ceremonies and commemorative uh, historical programs and all. But other than that, I haven't. Uh, it's uh, it's a thing of the past, and I I don't think of it often, but uh, uh, it's still a lot of things are etched in my mind. I'll never, never forget them. In the larger view, do you realize that, uh, recognize that you are a man who 
was at a place that is extremely large in American history. It's as though, you know, somebody who had been at the Battle of Gettysburg. Mm. Do you feel any sense of that no, kinship? No, I, I, uh, uh, someone said, what'd you do in the war, Daddy? You know, and I just say, uh, uh, Atlantic and Pacific, and uh, I uh, was an in invasion of Normandy. And, oh, you know, but I don't, I don't think of it in that sense that uh, they all did their job, whether it was one of the islands in the Pacific or uh, Italy or Africa or wherever they were stationed. Among the men that uh, were on that ship with you that day, are you in touch with any of them? No. Again, unfortunately, uh, uh, I haven't been. I, uh, one very good friend that was at Sampson and on both LSTs, we came back to the States and were given a 30-day leave and uh, he was from Boston environs. And uh, we came back to Fargo after 30 days, and he was assigned to Chelsea Naval Hospital, and I was assigned to Newport Naval Hospital. And we kept in touch, and he would see my parents occasionally. Then in six weeks, I was transferred out to the West Coast. Okay, let's stop there a second. Mm. Uh, you told me a minute ago that uh, after three trips from the Normandy coast back to England, you went back to England, and in July, I think you said, Yes. You went home? Yeah. We, uh, back made, to the States. We made our third trip, and when we came back, and of course the Navy never tells you anything other than pack up and be out, be standing here for muster right. at a certain time. Yeah. So uh, this was Southampton. So we went off to ship, and I think it was in the late evening. They like to do things in the dark, I guess. And uh, we went to uh, what they called a tent city in Southampton, uh, which was a common with tents up and uh, we asked what the story was and well you're going uh, waiting for a train to go to Roseneath, Scotland which is outside of Glasgow and I, they said they don't need you folks anymore because they've established an air base and they bring the wounded back in a matter of a very, a very much shorter time than bringing them back by, by ship and uh, saving more lives and so on. So at that point uh, they didn't need us. Uh, our ship, I'm sure, continued going back and forth with supplies for a long time to come. So we went uh, from Portsmouth to, uh, from uh, Southampton to Glasgow by train, the most, one of the most beautiful trips I've ever taken. It was, uh, it was fantastic, the uh, scenery. Uh, and then we went over to, Gla to uh, Roseneath, which uh, was on the coast, and waited for a ship to come in, a transport ship, to take a lot of us back to the States. Did you know you were going back to the States? No. We, I knew we were going from Southampton to Glasgow, which is a good indication that and they didn't need us anymore, so yeah. we were hoping it was there, not for reassignment you know, somewhere uh, over in Europe. Uh, but deep out, Dan, did you have the sneaking suspicion you might be on your way to the Pacific? Uh, yeah. That was one of the things. We were either going back to the East Coast or we are going back the other way into the into the Pacific. How did you feel about that? That uh, we had our druthers and uh, and uh, we talked a lot about it and what we'd rather do. And uh, when we finally got aboard the ship, it was a USS West uh, US uh, uh, West something, and it was an old not old, but it was a uh, a uh, cruise ship that had been uh, ocean liner that had been converted to a, a transport West West Point. USS West Point. And first thing aboard, uh, I said to one of the crewmen, I said, where are we going? He said, Boston. I said, Boston Mass? <laughs> I couldn't believe I'll it. I'll take it. Yeah, <laughs> right. So it was a very pleasurable trip coming back. We were alone, which was interesting. Uh, and every uh, four to five minutes, they changed course. Uh, we were fast. It was a fast ship. And uh, by changing course every four to five minutes, they told us that a, a sub couldn't set up uh, a uh, torpedo and fire it uh, uh, in that short a period of time. So every few minutes we'd uh, zigzag. So it took about seven days, I guess, to come across. Is this about July or August July. of 44? July, yeah. right. Yeah. So there's Boston. There's Boston. With no money except uh, British, naturally. We just uh, got off the ship and and uh, and didn't uh, go to any. Never were in a a city or anything uh, 
until we got to, got to the Fargo building in Boston. And uh, having only uh, British money, I, I wanted to make a telephone call, so uh, I had no money, so I borrowed a dime, and uh, to make a long story short, I, I, I knew the telephone operator where my father worked and my fiance worked, and uh, she accepted the call in Worcester. And uh, I talked to both my father and my uh, fiance uh, from somebody else's borrowed dime to make the make the call, so it was a complete surprise to us. Are my notes correct, Dick, that uh, there's a marriage impending here? Yes, I proposed on the telephone and uh, Blanche, the operator, was listening and it's, it was a fairly, my father had been there many, many years, my wife a few years, and it was a very close-knit group and everybody in American Steel, U.S. Steel, knew it uh, as, soon as, as soon as my wife and I knew it, that we were going to get married while I had the 30-day leave. Uh, and uh, Blanche told everybody, he got the, all the phones ringing in. Uh, I had 30-day leave with a, a guarantee of uh, 18 months uh, stateside duty uh, of a hospital of our choice. So uh, took the leave and we got married. And I came back after 30 days and uh, of course I wanted Chelsea, but I got New, uh, Newport, Rhode Island, which was still close to home. Then within uh, six weeks, uh, there was a group that went to Camp Shoemaker, California, of which most of us were from off the, off the Atlantic. Uh, I guess our papers were on top of the pile in the Navy Department and they pulled us and so I only had five weeks in, uh, in uh, the East Coast at that time. And then I went out to uh, 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 Camp Shoemaker. I still don't know where it is, it's in a valley somewhere out in, uh, in California. Can't help you there. Went to Oakland, no, went to Oakland and then by steak truck, standing in the back of a steak truck with a gear, uh, I don't know, we drove a couple of hours, I guess, to this godforsaken uh, hole in the desert, and that was uh, Camp Shoemaker. Uh, and I still, as I say, I don't know where it is today. What were your duties there? Just waiting for FFT, further transfer. And, uh, and they had promised you 18 months well, in the States? Well, there's nothing like you, you used to ask uh, an officer for, uh, you wanted to you know, go home for five day leave and uh, you had it coming to you and he says, you have nothing coming to you in the Navy. So they probably didn't promise it, but they said you would get, pick your, pick your place of duty and uh, you, you'd to be assigned there. Well, it didn't work out that way. Let me ask you a question. You went home and you got married. Um, in, at Worcester? Worcester. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, your dad was a Marine in World War I. Mm -hmm. What did you and I, he talk about? Well, he brought up a lot of memories to him. He was in some of the big battles over there, the uh, Shadow Woods and uh, uh, some of the real, real tough battles, and it uh, was hard on him. Mm -hmm. Harder than on me, my mother said, because he was reliving it as, as I uh, was going through it. They didn't know where I was, of course, or anything, but they knew it was. No, but they certainly heard about D-Day, and they knew you oh, were over right. there. Oh, right. They probably would yeah. be in that, yeah. I hope uh, sometime you're writing down um, what you and your dad talked about, because there's a good juncture of history, the experiences you yeah. both had. One thing that came out of it was that uh, at first he was sorry, as I said, that night we had that, he had that meeting with the Marines that I didn't want the Marine Corps. But the more he thought it over and what happened, uh, he was glad I'd picked the Navy. Uh, so that was a, it came out of it. What happened to you from this mysterious Camp Shoemaker? Oh, we, uh, every morning we'd go up to uh, one of the buildings, administrative buildings, and there'd be a sign on the, typewritten uh, sign on the side of the building that the following men will report at a certain time with their gear and they're going to the Fleet Marine Force, they're going to a certain ship, or they're going here or there. And uh, uh, most of the friends I was with uh, went to the Fleet Marines, and as I said earlier, they had a real rough time when they were in some of the island invasions. And as I understand it, when uh, a Marine volunteers to go out and get a sniper or a machine gun nest, if he gets hit, they call a corpsman, the corpsman isn't asked to go, he, that's his duty to go. Uh, so they, they went through some real tough times. But uh, somehow they uh, misplaced or lost or something. 
my records and uh, I missed all that and I was sent to uh, Oakland and went aboard a YF, a yard freighter, which was a very small ship. Uh, what's, what's the date now, Dick? We're talking of uh, early 45. Early 45, yeah. so Iwo Jima is uh, taking place. Yeah, we, we uh, on the way out we hit uh, Kwajalein, I mean, just to stop for fuel and all, Kwajalein and we talk before we got to the Carolyn Islands. So that, uh, uh, but they were all after the fact, but the damage and scars and rusted equipment and, and it was all there. You could see what a battle they had had to take these islands. So, uh, but we'd, I missed all of that, fortunately. Where were you bound for? Where were you going? Uh, what were the, you carrying? The Carolyn Islands, uh, it was Ulithi. It's an atoll out in the mm -hmm. Carolyn Islands, and just one entrance that's easily handled, uh, controlled by mine sweeps and by, uh, they had ships guarding the entrance. Uh, and no, no one could get in or out without going through this small opening. Uh, and all the uh, supply ships were meeting there for the invasion of, of uh, Japan. And we had uh, half medical supplies and half small stores, the uh, uh, clothing, naval, uh, naval clothing. Uh, on our ship, and uh, other ships had, uh, you know, ammunition and there were oil, oil tankers. There were uh, ships that uh, carried uh, water, big water tankers, repair ships, uh, and uh, everybody was congregating there to make the invasion of, of Japan. So this is almost midsummer of '45 then. By that time, yeah. yeah. yeah what was, were to, what were your duties to be if Japan were invaded? Well, it was, it, it, I never, I never have known. We, were, we had the supplies on board and, and uh, uh, ready to resupply ships and I suppose uh, land bases with medical equipment, but uh, there would be no reason for us to, uh, other than be there, we didn't have any idea what the, what the duty would be. So it was, uh, the Pacific to me was R&R, uh, uh, &R, so to speak, as far as uh, except being away. It was uh, it wasn't nearly as hazardous as uh, as the other side. Somewhere in here, you heard that uh, two atomic bombs were dropped, mm -hmm. and shortly thereafter, the war was over. Where were you then, Dick? We were between uh, Ulithi and uh, the Carolyn Islands. I mean, sorry, between uh, Anawitok and and the Carolyn Islands, Ulithi, on the last leg of our trip to this supply. Center, and uh, we heard it on the ship's radio, uh, both of them, and uh, and uh, the uh, it was quite a you know it was a, what a relief. War is over. Right. You came home. Well, did we had to still go on to to Ulithi, and they still gathered, and they still sent them up, uh, but instead of an, uh, an invasion force, it was an occupation force, mm -hmm. which was a much different feeling for the fellows. As soon as we got to Ulithi, uh, the service came out with uh, the point system. So many points for your age, so many points for each battle star, so many points for married, uh, so many points for months in the service, and every day we had add up our points. Well, I was having a battle between getting enough points and going back on a troop ship before they were leaving, the whole flotilla was leaving for Japan. and. Uh, I finally got my points, went to the officer and said, uh, I'm ready to go home. And he tried to talk me into staying in the, in the Navy. Uh, and, right. <laughs> and also, the Merchant Marine had come up with an idea that pharmacist mates could uh, go into the Merchant Marine as, I think it was third officers. They would be, the, it was a small ship that wouldn't take uh, a full medical staff, but to be somebody aboard who had medical knowledge and you'd be third officer in the merchant marine and uh, I, uh, I said thanks but uh, no thanks. This is for a guy who never went through boot camp. Yeah, that's right. That was a pretty good deal. Right, right. How did you get home? You sail uh, home or fly home? No, the, uh, the, we were ready to leave and the day before we left the troop ship came in and I got aboard that and I waved to the uh, our fellows as they were getting ready to form the convoy to go up to Japan, so I lucked out by a matter of hours. 
uh, we came back to uh, San Francisco and uh, uh, from then train across the country to Fargo building. Again? Again. Uh, yeah. Started there in, in, the, in the Atlantic and then we were discharged from the Fargo building. And uh, it was uh, November 26th, 1945, me. November 26th, 1945. Mm -hmm. You've had quite an experience. Um, is there any particular experience that you would think of that is more outstanding than all the other adventures you had in those years? No, there were there were several times that uh, I never thought about uh, being a fatalist or anything, but uh, I became one uh, in the uh, after the service. Not to the point that I mean, I'm sure you can you can help yourself get into trouble, but uh, when your time is up, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, uh, your, your time is up. We had one case where a torpedo, we saw the torpedo coming, this is back in Normandy between England and France, and uh, the lookout on the bridge came running in and said there's a torpedo, we could see it coming toward us, and it went under us. We only drew nine feet of water because it was a very shallow ship because we went up on the beach and they had set the torpedo too, too low. So it went under us and we watched it go out the other side. And that was one close call. Then uh, in one of the other trips to Normandy and back, the minesweepers swept the corridor we used, but evidently a mine had uh, come loose. And we, we saw the mine in front of us, we couldn't turn, and we, we heard it hit about midships underneath. And then we saw it bounce off the, the, off the stern well, it must, have been, it must have been a dud. I mean, uh, otherwise, how would you account for it? So things like that uh, make you, and also not being in that uh, lead con the ship in that uh, uh, exercise back in uh, England before when they lost those two LSTs. We would have been one of those two LSTs had we not go back. And we went back, we found out, because we had the flag with us. An admiral was on board our ship to uh, watch the maneuvers, and I guess they wanted to keep him naturally uh, out of danger, so they pulled us back from the front of the convoy to, uh, uh, as I said, about a half an hour back of the lead ship, and those two lead ships got it, and the third was uh, badly damaged and a large loss of life. So uh, I feel that, uh, uh, that I had uh, some lucky breaks. Your number just wasn't up. That's right, it yeah. wasn't my time. God help me for asking this question, but was uh is there any humorous experience that you can think of? Yeah, I uh, forgot where it was, but uh, some of the boys uh, went ashore one night, and uh, this was over in England, and uh, they must have got a bad ice cube or something, as the saying goes, and uh, they came back to the ship, and there was quite a breeze blowing, and uh, they had a hard time getting up the gangway on the ship, but they managed it, and then one of the fellows lost his hat, over the side, he just dove right in between the ship and the pier, which is unheard of, it's so dangerous because the ship could come back in to retrieve his cap. <laughs> and there was quite a to-do with the men overboard and about two or three in the morning, and uh, they got him out. And yeah, that's the bad ice cube. <laughs> that's the bad ice cube. Uh, and then uh, there was one that uh, the, uh, Everybody was at their battle stations, and some of the men uh, were in the gun tubs. Uh, we had 20 millimeter and 40 millimeter uh, guns, and uh, they would have to ask permission to go down below to the head. We were there for hours at a time, and sometimes a day at a time or two. And uh, they, each of the gun tubs had a crew of three or four. One had a, a telephone, uh, and uh, uh, you know, it could call the bridge and the bridge is where the captain was, and we were right below the bridge uh, in the wheelhouse with the communication through a speaking tube. And uh, so they'd call up from a gun tub and say, uh, Captain, uh, request permission to send one man down below. And uh, he'd say, permission granted. Well, after a while, he guess he, there were too many down below, so somebody else, uh, called another gun tub and asked the captain, and the captain didn't do the speaking. He told his speaker what to say in the, in the phone, and the speaker just broke up and 
he said, the captain says to use the gun barrel. There's too many people down below now. <laughs> so uh, there was some. That's how we lost the war. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. For the record, at, uh, at what rank and with what decorations uh, were you uh, retired from the military? I came out uh, first class pharmacist mate, first mm -hmm. class petty officer, and had the American, the European, Pacific, theater ribbons, uh, victory ribbon, and of course, the, the Good Conduct Medal, uh, which wasn't hard to do in, uh, in, in those days. You were, you know, well confined and all. But some fellows found a way to uh, get uh, promoted, and then they'd foul up, and they'd drop back a grade or two, and, but uh, those are the ribbons that I, uh, that I had. Very good. Did you join any reserve unit after you <clears throat> came home? That was another thing that uh, luck was with me. I went uh, from the service, I went to uh, Clark University in Worcester uh, for my uh, college, and a bunch of us fellows, not, we, we hadn't known each other, there were Army, Marines, and Navy, but we uh, sort of were a, a group, sort of stuck together with the other freshmen who were in their late teens. And uh, we went down to City Hall one day, and there was a trailer, and it was a, a U.S. Navy Reserve recruiting station, and they wanted uh, uh, ex-veterans, or veterans to sign up for the reserves. And we almost went in, and one fellow did. And about six months later, he was, he was gone uh, into, into Korea. Into Korea. Yeah. So uh, again, luck was with me. Yeah. I didn't sign up. But I haven't been active in the... Uh, Veteran of Foreign Wars or the American Legion. Okay, that's all. what I was going to ask you. Um, what were your feelings uh, about the war you served in and what you did vis-a-vis -vis the experiences of men who went to Korea or Vietnam? Can you contrast mm. or compare what happened there? Well, I think it's a shame the way they were treated. Uh, it was just as big a problem or bigger problem in some cases uh, in those latter two situations uh, uh, and I just have always felt badly that they were treated so badly. Uh, with us we uh, had all the latest equipment and had latest of everything and at least in the Navy we never wanted for, for food, might have been K rations or C rations during uh, general quarters when they couldn't, cooks were on guns and couldn't uh, cook anything naturally but at least we had a dry bed to uh, come back to and uh, whenever we get off duty and uh, but the uh, Korea and Vietnam uh, it, it was it took a second uh, back seat to the to the quote big war World War two which I think is a shame and I think it's terrible the way they've been uh, treated I don't want to uh, ask you a question that I might have already asked but <clears throat> um, You've had a long time to think about what you did. What did you think about the war that uh, you were in and gave a lot of your life to? I haven't really given it uh, much thought. Again, I was a kid, and uh, a lot of it was a lark, uh, believe it or not. I mean, it, uh, at that time, I didn't think about the future too much, and uh, I, uh, uh, I really don't... Uh, I think it was, it was necessary, certainly, and uh, it was uh, was none too soon. But I, I, uh, I and I still I think the other two were also probably the Korea and Vietnam. But I think it was very necessary to uh, stop things where they were, both in the Pacific and uh, uh, in Europe. We're talking about things that happened over half a century ago. Uh, your experience mm. in the military. <clears throat> Do you feel in some way it affected your life, or did you do it and then get on with your life? Well, I get on with my life, but uh, I uh, am ever grateful to the, uh, the government. I uh, got uh, my uh, bachelor's degree from Clark University. They had a special uh, group of us. Uh, now it's very common, but we went, uh, went through in 30, 36 months rather than four years. They, we had two summer sessions as well as the fall and spring uh, semesters and uh, I started in 46 and got out in 49 uh, mm -hmm. and uh, this was the first time they tried that 
And I got that. And then later on, when I was working in Boston, I went six years nights and got my master's at BU. And uh, both of those complete programs uh, cost me $110 to have my thesis uh, typed for the master's degree. So I, as I say, I, I owe nothing. They owe nothing to me uh, for... Uh, so you took full advantage of the GI Absolutely. educational bill. Yeah. Did you take, uh, have you used any other veterans benefits, hospitalization, no. insurance, no, mortgages, have, anything I like have that? a little insurance, but uh, uh, I don't, uh, just the normal insurance, I haven't done anything, anything else. I have not been involved with the veterans uh, other than the GI at all. We're almost at the end of this tape, Dick. Um, <clears throat> Is there any one thought, one incident, one thing that you would like to uh, tell us uh, to share with your family, to share with others who will be looking at this tape? Not, not, uh, not really. I just, as I say, uh, I think it was a great experience. I'm not sure that uh, I couldn't have done without it, but I mean, uh, in hindsight, it, uh, it was a, certainly a maturing experience. and. Uh, for someone who was only uh, 20 when uh, when I went in, uh, it certainly it certainly uh, I grew up in the in the next three or four years, and I think it uh, for all we went through, and I went through a lot much less than so many fellows that I know, and uh, in all that uh, it was a tremendous learning experience that uh, in my case was uh, very good for me. Dick Smith. We thank you for coming in. Thank you. We, we're grateful to your uh, contribution to our program, and you're a very articulate man, and we thank you. Thank you very much.